Good morning, everybody. My name is Brock Blevins, and welcome again to our webinar series, Ecosystem Restoration, Global Initiatives in Science and Practice. This is our October session. Thanks for joining us. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, each month, uh, we have a different speaker. He'll give a 40 to 45 minute presentation on their work. Everything revolved around restoration. We'll have a question and answer session at the end. If you have any questions throughout the session, uh, just type them in the Q&A box and we'll get to those at the end. Um, and you can use the chat box to introduce yourself to the other restoration enthusiasts and practitioners from around the world. Um, and if you're interested in Commission on Ecosystem Management membership, please email Kara or myself and we can let you know the process. So, uh, without further ado, uh, so we are joined here today with Karen Hull. Karen Hull is a professor at the University of California, Santa Cruz. She studies how, rest, how to restore forests in Latin America and California for over 30 years and works with a number of nonprofit and governmental organizations on how to implement forest restoration efforts. We are also joined here today with Matthew Fagan. He's a conservation ecologist and geographer interested in landscape restoration. His research links the analysis of satellite and aerial imagery or remote sensing with field data to understand how forests and trees, tree plantations are changing over time. And we're also joined here by Pedro Braquillon, and he, he's from the University of Sao Paulo and he is involved in large scale forest restoration efforts. And I'm going to pass this off to Karen to get us started. Thank you very much for joining us here today, Karen. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Um, so thanks for the introduction, Brock. And as Brock mentioned, um, my colleagues and I are gonna be talking about how we could do hopefully a better job and improve our outcomes of tree planting campaigns. So as I'm sure most of you know, um, there are many forest restoration and tree planting campaigns worldwide. One of the first was the Bond Challenge, um, which proposes to restore 350 million hectares globally by 2030. That's an area the size of India. That's underpinned by a number of um, regional uh, efforts, such as the 20 by 20 initiative in Latin America and the AFR 100 in Africa, as well as a number of national commitments. More recently, there have been at least three trillion tree planting campaigns, the one by the World Economic Forum, 1T.org, Plant for the Planet, and another by three different large international nonprofit organizations. And probably the most recently in 2021, we'll be starting the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. And one question is, you know, why is everybody jumping on the tree planting bandwagon? And I think there's a fairly uh, clear, there's probably many explanations, but one of the explanations is the following. Um, people are bombarded by hundreds of media messages every day, and the story they hear from the media is rooted in crisis and environmental destruction. The problems that are presented are dramatic and overwhelming, and people are left with the feeling that they can't do anything, leading ultimately to a sense of apathy and despair. So then comes along tree planting, which seems like this silver bullet. Both the scientific community and the popular media have suggested a simple solution that people can relate to. And businessmen, YouTubers, and various uh, media personalities are all saying that this is a really great solution to solve some really complex problems. We're told that tree planting has mind-blowing potential to tackle the climate crisis. Trees are something we can understand, and it seems like a practical and straightforward way to solve of some of the most challenging threats ever facing humanity. But then comes the critique, and we start to hear that um, the proposals are, we, we, we start to hear these, that there may be some issues, that maybe there's some scientific problems, or we really need to think about local communities and how they're affected. And I'll just acknowledge that my co-speakers today and I have been part of that critique. So what is the critique? Um, well, first of all, we know that tree planting in, has many potential benefits. Um, you can, it helps to enhance carbon and water storage. Um, it can also increase landscape connectivity and native biodiversity. Um, and it can hopefully engage stakeholders, both in urban and rural areas. And in the best of cases, it can also enhance the livelihoods of the people 
who, um, uh, who own the areas where the trees are planted. But there are also potential negative effects if tree planting is not done well. We know that planting into arid areas has the potential to increase evapotranspiration, particularly if, um, because they transpire, fast growing trees transpire a lot of water. If trees are planted into non, uh, into ecosystems that didn't formerly have trees like historical grasslands, it can actually destroy ecosystems. And there's the potential to plant trees that might be invasive and invade existing ecosystems. In the worst case scenario, tree planting can actually lead to social conflicts. And one of the big concerns is what's called leakage or displacement. And that's when people who um, are farming in those areas and then we plant trees as we just shift those activities into forests. And so it actually causes more forest destruction. And there's also some other issues. Um, this is sort of a quick overview. And we go into these in our, Pedro and I do in some of our recent papers. And what we find is that over and over again, poor planning and top-down projects have unfortunately led to some disappointing outcomes. In some cases like these in Turkey and in Canada, there was poor survival of trees because of, um, because of you know, poor planning and the trees weren't maintained or the wrong species were planted. In some of the most concerning cases when locals haven't been involved, they've actually gone in and pulled out the trees. And so we don't have the desired outcomes. So I wanna make really clear that our goal today is to try to take the enthusiasm for tree planting and try to think about how we could increase the success of these efforts over space and time. And in particular, what we'd like to do is we'd like to change the narrative from tree planting to tree growing. A lot of the goals right now are about how many trees we're putting in the ground, but we all know that if we wanna get those benefits that we hope to get, like carbon sequestration and biodiversity conservation and benefits to human livelihoods, those trees need to survive on the landscape. And so we really should be thinking about how we can grow trees and how we can make sure that they're there multiple decades into the future. And in order to do that successfully, we need to start by thinking about why we're doing the tree growing. And I'll talk about that. And then think about where to do that and how to do that in the best way possible so that we have more success, which is what Matt and Pedro will talk about in their sessions. So yeah, we need, okay, go on here. But before I start to talk about that, I wanna start with two key premises that underlie what we're talking about today. First of all, it's really important to know that tree growing or other natural climate solutions are not a substitute for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We know that a certain amount of greenhouse gas emissions come from land use change, but the vast majority of them come from other anthropogenic uses like the transportation sector, housing, and other reasons. And so any solution to reducing greenhouse gas emissions cannot rely entirely on tree planting or other types of natural climate solutions, which we talked about more broadly in the seminar last month. We know that they're one part of the solution, and I'm not gonna argue how large of this wedge they make up, but just suffice it to say that if we're going to make the dramatic changes we need to make um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we have to use every tool we have in our toolbox and natural climate solutions are just one of those and we need to reduce emissions. Another really important premise is that we need to reduce drivers of deforestation and prioritize protecting existing forest cover. I've been a restoration ecologist for 30 years. I can say that I'd like to think that my work has helped us to do a better job of restoration, but we're never going to completely recreate what was there before. We wanna keep what we have already. We also know that there's a time lag, that we need the forests now, and we need to make sure that we keep those trees here and we're not just waiting for we cut them down and then we have to wait for decades for them to come back. And finally, these existing forests, whether they're small remnants or larger areas, they're really critical sources of plants and animals to help greater tree growing efforts and to catalyze forest recovery in adjacent areas. So why do people grow trees? People grow trees for a broad range of reasons, which are often not well specified. We, in a lot of cases, have focused on carbon uh, conserving biodiversity. These days, much of the talk is about sequestering carbon. Um, there's also interest in improving water and air quality. In urban areas, people plant trees to provide shade and increase green space in cities. Oftentimes, there's a focus on people providing, and it's critical to provide income to people in the lands where they're working because that's the only way you're going to engage them. So we think about agroforestry or other products. 
And there's many, many more reasons that, again, Pedro and I in our recent Journal of Applied Ecology discuss. What's important to note is that there are trade-offs. Um, we can sometimes have you know, multiple benefits in the same projects, but we're not going to maximize all the different um, we're not going to maximize all the different um, benefits. And as an example of that, and sort of the hierarchy of, of tree planting goals and how they can be potentially conflicting within and across scales, I want to use the example of the Brazilian Atlantic forest where um, Pedro does a lot of his work. So the national plan for Brazil uh, has a goal of about 12 million hectares of uh, res restoration of Atlantic forest by 2030. But that's part of a whole hierarchy of commitments from the global to the farm level. At the global level, as I said, there's a lot of focus on carbon sequestration. Um, other organizations at the global level are interested in carbon sequestration as well as biodiversity conservation. At the regional level, um, at the national level, there's a lot of focus on planting along riparian areas to improve water quality. But ultimately at the farm level, most farmers who are planting trees want to make sure they can provide food, firewood, and income. And it's not that these goals, which I, will, I want to state up front are oversimplified, but just this is an example. It's not that these are necessarily in contrast, but it may be that the fastest growing trees are the ones that conserve biodiversity of the rare trees. They may not be the same ones that farmers want to plant for food and firewood and income. And so what we need to be thinking about is how are we going to coordinate those goals early in the process so we can design projects accordingly. Um, and one of the ways that, that they've done Atlantic Forest is the Atlantic Forest Pact, which is a coalition of over 270 nonprofit government and academic groups who are working together in part to increase communications about these goals, but also to develop best restoration practices, to do coordinated research, to do training and capacity building, and to develop um, a more standardized monitoring protocol to evaluate whether these pro they're succeeding. So some of the overall keys to improving efforts to grow trees, as I said, include clearly defining and agreeing to goals among stakeholders of given projects, and then to select where to achieve those goals, particularly for the international groups that are trying to coordinate with local bottom-up efforts. It is critical to go through a careful planning process of whether and how to plant trees to improve success, which is what Pedro will talk about, and it's also important to plan for permanence, um, which um, these second and fourth points that uh, Matt will be talking about more in his talk. And when I talk about planting for permanence, what I mean is that we need to be thinking about maximizing desired impacts over time and not just scale. And so perhaps rather than saying that we want to plant 1 trillion trees, we should be saying something like we want to aim for 200 bill billion trees that are alive and growing in 20 years. And this requires monitoring and adaptive management. And I'd like to close with my portion with an example from Tigray, Ethiopia. Um, this is not my own work, so it's, this is the citation for this source. Um, they um, have been working on, um, they were doing a top-down type restoration and giving people the trees to plant and had less than 30% survival. But now that they've increased to greater than 80% survival. So how did they do that? Well, they did a number of things that have been successful in a lot of projects, such as changing the government structure to engage stakeholders throughout the process in planning, nursery work, planting, and monitoring. They improved research and training. Um, they also improved the nurseries and the genetic quality of the trees, which is important. And they incorporated maintenance, um, such as watering and fertilization, which is often necessary, particularly in highly degraded ecosystems. And as a result, they had a lot higher success on this hill slope here. Um, and an interesting point is that they transferred tree ownership to um, the people who were planting them, which gave them a lot more incentive to maintain them long term. Another thing they did was to encourage farmer managed natural regeneration. And so these trees here are trees that weren't planted, but they were actually re-sprouted in farmer's land. So with that, I'd like to pass um, over to Matt, who will be talking about where to do um, tree, to, where to grow trees. Thank you, Karen. I wanted to shift gears a bit and deepen the conversation about where we should reforest. There are lots of considerations that go into selecting where we grow trees, but let's begin by talking about scale. At global scales, the question of where we reforest often translates to 
to which regions are we going to funnel money and for which global goals? For example, long-term carbon sequestration, which benefits from a targeted flow of funding to regions with large carbon pools or rapid uptake. As funds move into a place, we start having more fine-grained questions about where to target reforestation to achieve local goals like connectivity, water quality, or to improve human well-being. Let's begin at the broadest scale and talk about how we identify global restoration opportunities. One approach is to basically map where we think trees can exist or potential tree cover and subtract where trees are. And the difference is places we can grow trees, places we can reforest. Shown here is the Bastine et al. map published in Science last year, which produced an estimate of nearly a trillion hectares available for restoration. This big map inspired intense media interest. But the downside of this approach is that in general, it does a poor job estimating restoration opportunities, especially in drylands and agricultural regions. I've highlighted a few of those dryland ecosystems in red boxes here. Now in those red boxes, the green in this map shows where actual tree cover is higher than that predicted by satellite-based maps. So while satellite-based maps suggest they need additional tree cover, they do not in reality. There are already trees there. So this sort of methodology tends to overestimate drylands restoration, and by further ignoring fire and leaving out agricultural regions, it comes up with some pretty skewed estimates across biomes. For example, agroforestry is not even considered as an option in these global maps. If we instead focus our predictions of restoration potential on one biome, we can come up with better targeting. This work by Pedro and co-authors focuses on deforested lands in the humid tropical biome. It ranks them by the potential benefits of regrowing forest there, weighted by the likelihood that those forests will be re-cleared. This sort of detailed work is defensible and clear. The main challenge here is, is that it is difficult in many biomes, like dry biomes, to map degraded habitat and pressures for habitat conversion. But at the national scale, many countries are trying. This colorful map shows the IUCN Restoration Opportunities Assessment Methodology, or ROAM, in El Salvador, which is a national process of identifying degraded ecosystems. The benefits of this process is that it engages local expertise and government, creating buy-in. However, given the political nature of this exercise, estimates are often based on internal data and not terribly detailed and thus optimistic. Here is a plot of voluntary national restoration commitments, with country names abbreviated. The y-axis shows the total country area pledged, and the x-axis shows the percent of country land area that that commitment occupies. I've highlighted El Salvador's commitment of 1 million hectares in yellow. It occupies roughly half the country's area. The red box shows Burundi and Rwanda, which committed about 80% of their country's area to restoration. And the orange box here, shows you still larger commitments by Vietnam, Korea, and Malawi. Ambition is not in short supply here. But on the bright side, there isn't a shortage either of countries interested in restoration. So when we think about where to grow forests on a broad scale, there's a lot of enthusiasm. But spatial planning allows us to prepare for and prioritize these opportunities, letting us take full advantage of the chances we get. To aid your spatial planning process, I want to discuss three principles that I feel should guide where, guide where we grow trees. Tailoring, targeting, and anchoring reforestation. The first principle is that forests have a time and a place, and tree growing should be tailored to that place. You might look at the picture above and think that the forest on the right is an example of successful restoration. No. The prairie on the left side has been restored by fire, and the degraded prairie on the right needs to be burned more frequently. The prairie has greater biodiversity and giving recurring natural fires locks away carbon in its roots far longer than the woodland. Restoration has to be done with an eye toward climate and local ecosystems. Now here's an attempt to use forests outside their biome for an appealing goal, planting trees to hold back the advance of the Gobi Desert in Western China. But reality is often quite different from Photoshop propaganda. Yes, this is the same picture. Most of these planted non-native forests have struggled to survive in the shrubland ecosystem they replaced with broad diebacks and negative effects on local water availability. 
Now, a related principle that Karen already mentioned is that tree growing should not replace existing habitats. This is an image of a shrubby, degraded, tropical dry forest in Telangana, India, being cleared for this government-sponsored eucalyptus plantation. From the standpoint of biodiversity or carbon, this is self-defeating. One thing spatial data can do is help us understand where natural habitat loss is occurring and to avoid planting in those places and where we can assist natural recovery. But the key here is communication because natural habitat clearing for tree growing often arises from cultural definitions of degraded land or from competing goals. In Costa Rica, for example, it's very common to clean up wooded pastures of remnant rainforest trees for reforestation projects with native species or to illegally clear secondary forests for agriculture. Secondary forests being short and scrubby are easy to clear. Spatial data can help us avoid clearing native ecosystems and help us target tree growing to areas with high growth potential. Shown here is a great map produced by Cook Patton et al. showing the global potential of natural forest and savanna regrowth in sequestering carbon. Levering, leveraging global products like this one is great and has marked cost and quality benefits, but you should kick the tires a bit. Most global products are fine for global analyses, like projecting carbon uptake for the IPCC in this case, but can contain errors which limit their utility at regional scales. To the right is the Hansen Global Forest Change product over Costa Rica. The red shows our cultural areas mapped as forest, while the purple shows areas of tropical dry forests that were mapped as wooded pastures. Correcting this map to reflect actual dry forest tree cover increased cover estimates in some protected areas by as much as 700%. But once you have the right set of maps for a region, spatial prioritization tools can help you target which parts of the landscape you want to target for tree growing. And I give you a link there to tools that can help you do that. For example, if you want to increase habitat connectivity and protect key habitats, you might do an analysis like the one to the right, which shows a large biological corridor in northern Costa Rica with forests in black. The green shows key forest bridges to protect, while the yellow and red target areas for maximal increases in habitat connectivity. In general, planting, tree, planting less in the right spot is better than planting more, as the government did in this case with its scattershot approach. Where possible, tree planting should be targeted to provide both global benefits like biodiversity and local benefits like water quality, soil retention, and so on. And as Karen pointed out, the longer new trees persist, the more ecosystem services they provide. That's an important point to stop and consider because most new forests are not going to last. The map to the right shows in yellow places in South America where initial increases in forest cover reverse themselves over time. Across this region, half of secondary forests are reclared in 5 to 20 years. Now, it might be obvious to you that unproductive natural forests are at risk as they are regrowing on temporarily abandoned agricultural land. But it is important to keep in mind that productive tree growing like timber plantations and agroforestry are also unlikely to last long. They are planted near roads, near existing farms, harvested regularly, and demands for cropland constantly change. Agricultural land uses turn over frequently and are not permanent. Now, if you look across forested landscapes and ask, where do young forests tend to stick around? They stick around on communally protected land, in inaccessible or unproductive locations, such as near existing forests, on steep slopes, and near rivers. Now, what does all that mean? You should plan for pressure. This is a tree growing project under fire in Madagascar. The lessons from the setback were used to create fire resistant tree plantings. Before you start tree planting, there are a host of spatial data sets describing the current and projected pressures that regrowing trees will face in different regions from climate change to fire, from deforestation to road building, to urban expansion. Hope plants trees, but planning sustains them. 
Maps like these can help you anticipate ecological and socioeconomic challenges across a landscape and increase long-term tree survival. But to anchor tree growing projects in a landscape for the long run, they need to be good neighbors. To limit conflict and build support, they should minimize lost agricultural production and not preempt communal land. That eucalyptus plantation I showed you before, the scrubby forest it replaced was communal land before it was converted to a plantation. Karen pointed out plenty of examples where, if locals disagree with the planting going on, they will do something about it. Local communities control regional land use, and no tree growing project lasts for a long time without local support. Thus, spatial planning should involve local communities from the beginning. And evolving social scientists is important to understand social impacts and expectations, especially as expectations differ between top-down and bottom-up perspectives. No long-term tree-growing project is an island. They are part of a landscape, changing and being changed. So finally, if you want to commit to long-term tree-growing, you need to monitor and report your progress. You should expect failure and report dynamic change, not area reforested. Brazil's reporting from the Amazon to the Bond Challenge was the area of new secondary forests, and it contained nothing about how most of those secondary forests only last five to 10 years in a given spot, or that the total area of secondary forests was declining. If we are not monitoring carefully, we will miss the net impact of our project on the landscape. Here's a case study from the Atlantic Forest to Brazil, where increases in new forest obscured losses in older forests total tree cover in the black line there stayed roughly steady. As Karen pointed out, taking parts of a landscape out of agricultural production can cause leakage or shifts of producers to other areas. So if you want to understand the net impact of a tree growing project on carbon, biodiversity, or equity, you need to monitor the whole landscape. There are lots of training resources to improve your ability to do remote monitoring, and I would be happy to discuss those after the talk. But monitoring over time is the key to improving your net impact and making all that spatial planning worth it. Thank you, Pedro. Hi everybody, I'm Pedro Brancalhon, and I will explore with you how to plant trees. But I'm not start talking about where to get the tree seedlings and how to plant them because I have a, a first and more important question to make, which is if we do have to plant trees in the area where we want to grow a forest back. That's because nature can do it for us pretty well. We have many different types of birds, bats, monkeys, or even the wind that could bring native trees, tree seeds to the area where we want to reforest. And this can be much cheaper and effective than planting the tree seedlings there. So like, for instance, in this case, it's a farmer in the Amazon and it, he had to, to expand the area of native forest to comply with the laws. And he simply stopped cultivating the land for soybeans and then the soil seed bank and also the dispersal of seeds from neighboring forests was, it was enough for supporting the regeneration of the forest without having to, to invest money to plant the tree seedlings and to take care of it. So natural forest regrowth is the most cost-effective solution usually to grow a forest, a native forest in a degraded area. That's because it's cheaper than tree planting because you don't have to buy tree seedlings, you don't have to cultivate them, you don't have to, to maintain the site. It is more scale, scalable because nature can do it with thousands of animals working for free 24, 24 hours a day. And usually it, it relies on locally adapted species and species with a very good interaction with the local fauna and without uh, having to use unintendedly invasive species in the process. So when we want to support natural forest regrowth, we have to decide 
in which areas, in which conditions this process can happen effectively. And usually the areas with a higher chances for effective natural generation are those close from, from forest remnants and in areas that were less intensively used in the past. So we can create predictive models to identify the areas where natural regeneration can occur at more effectively, and then we can target these areas for reforestation. But at the same time, natural regeneration is effective for restoring a native forest, but this is only one of the many potential objectives of a tree planting program. So for instance, we can support natural regeneration in deforested areas, but we may also restore degraded remnants. We can support the development of trees that have been uh, suppressed by the great, by hyperabundant climbers, by invasive species, by edge effects, or even when we, we decide for, for using natural regeneration, in some cases, we have to assist this, the process by controlling invasive grasses or invasive species in the area, by isolating the area from, from cattle grazing and other types of disturbance that may prevent an effective regeneration of the native forest. In other cases, we may not have the option to count on natural regeneration because the resilience of the site is low. But at the same time, we don't have to plant the trees across the whole area. We can plant trees in some portions of the site through spatially patterned planting methods like applying nucleation. And with time, these trees can grow, their canopy can expand they can attract uh, seed dispersers and the planted trees may foster natural regeneration. So with time, the, the tree nuclei can expand and occupy the whole site. So we don't have necessarily to plant the whole site to cover it with trees. But in other case, this may be the, the, the best option. So we may have uh, less time to restore a forest, or we, we may not have a very good natural regeneration potential, or farmers and, and decision makers, they want to plant specific types of trees that may cover the whole area for different purposes. So we may use mixed species tree plantings when we usually want to bring more environmental benefits to the site. But at the same time, we can use alternative techniques to establish trees across the whole area. So instead of planting the tree seedlings, we can use direct seeding. We can use the seeds instead of the seedlings to establish the new forest. But as I mentioned before, people may decide to plant trees for many different, re many different reasons, including producing timber. So they may prefer to intercrop some exotic species, but with very high commercial value with native species in order to achieve both environmental and financial objectives. But in other cases, they may focus on the financial objectives of the project and decide to plant monocultures of commercially valuable species, native or exotic, or even to use agroforestry systems to combine timber production with crop production. So we are not advocating for one or another type of tree planting. All of them can be the best solution, depending on the project goals and the social and biophysical context of the site of the area where the project will be implemented. So that's critically important to consider socioeconomic factors because in many cases, we may not restore a forest. We may have to plant trees for, for achieving people's goals, goals that may not rely necessarily on reestablishing re a native forest in the area. So we have to account for many different factors 
that influence the decisions, including the factors rela related to biophysical conditions. So we have to account for the costs of the process. We have to know how much we would cost. We have also to consider who has land tenure, who has the, per the, the right to the permanent use of the land. It has an enormous impact on the, pers on the, on the, on the persistence of the forest cover and how the forest will be managed by people. We have also to consider market demands because if we want to, to obtain financial objectives of the project, we have to consider that we have to sell the trees, sell the wood, sell the fruits, the nuts to somebody else. So we have to account for markets and also legal demands because in many cases, people plant trees to comply with laws. But there are also some important culture and cultural and traditional factors related to how local people value and use trees. But although many people think in, in, uh, about how many trees will be planted or which, is, or which, which area will be planted, there are many other important factors to be addressed in a tree growing project. That's because we have to, to support the growth of the trees that were planted and it may require different techniques of management. For instance, we may have to control weeds, we may have to fertilize the site over time, we have to irrigate some of the seedlings in the case of areas more vulnerable to drought, we may have to control for invasive species and many other things that have to be done and have to, to be budgeted for, the, for the, the coming years. So tree planting, when we plant the trees, we are just starting a process that may last for many years and we have to be sure that we have funding and all of the, the capacity to manage the site effectively in order to support the growth of the trees and to then achieve the benefits expected from the process. So here is an example of a project in Atlantic Forest where we employ different ways to manage the tree plantation and it resulted in a very high variation of carbon sequestration by the forests. And since tree planting is not a simple solution or a simple activity, it's, we have to consider that people have to be trained, they have to know the different options they have for growing trees. So they have to know well the tree planting menu, consider the potential trade-offs that may result from, from the decisions to be made. We have to consider the different types and levels of knowledge because we have the scientific knowledge, but also the, the very, the quite valuable knowledge of local people that know the species and know the systems. And, and finally, I think it's critically important to establish pilot sites since we cannot anticipate all of the important factors driving tree planting success. And then we have to monitor the areas because as I said before, we are still learning how to promote tree planting effectively and, and we are doing it in a context of global climate change and, and the Indian tropical scene. So we have to monitor the forest, we have to know if they are growing, if the forest is growing well, if the objectives we initially established for the project has been achieved. So this is an example in the Atlantic Forest in which we have used different remote sensing approaches for upscaling restoration monitoring, for reducing its, co its costs, and also to allow for different uh, monitoring uh, activities in the, in the coming, in the following years after the, the beginning of the tree growing project. So as since tree planting and tree growing is not rocket science, we don't have uh, a very clear solution for the problems. We have many questions to, that have to be made before starting a project, like what are the project goals and what strategy is best to achieve those goals? How much will it cost and who will pay for it? We have many different costs in a tree growing project and we have to know which are these costs and who will pay for them. Is the land tenure secure? 
and how will the landowners be compensated for lost income? So that's critical because people make a living on the land. And if we plant the trees where they, they, they grow crops, they may not uh, continue to live there. And, that, and this may bring important social implications. As well, who will grow the tree seedlings and plant them, care them, and monitor the trees? Is land tenure secure and how will landowners be compensated? I said it before. But finally, how and when to evaluate whether the project has been successful or whether corrective actions need to be taken? So these are just examples of critical questions to be made before the, the tree the trees are planted and they were covered in a, in a recent paper that I published with my colleague Karen Hall. So I'd like to reiterate that tree planting can have many different benefits, but also unintended consequences and trade-offs that cannot be avoided. So we have to consider that tree planting is a complex activity and that can be done in many different ways so we have to initially establish which are our goals. It has to be done transparently with different stakeholders in order to engage both local community and international investors in the process, safeguard long-term funding, and ultimately achieve the initial uh, goals targeted for that specific project. So thank you all for listening and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much to all of our presenters today. We have had a pretty active session in the chat and some questions within the Q&A box. And um, the first set of questions were, uh, specific to Matt, based on some of, some of the modeling that he presented, and so I'll read um, I'll read the first one. It's about your point about actual versus potential forest. Are your conclusions based on discrete measures of forest or percentage forest cover? If the former, what was the threshold for forest? If the latter, what suggestions do you have for improving a global biome-based map of forest cover? I think, so there's two studies in that particular paper. The first used a 10% forest cover definition, and that was the Atlas of Forest Landscape Restoration, which I didn't present in this talk. And they had the same issue in drylands that the um, percent forest cover-based study, which is the study that I showed you in this talk by Vestine et al. Um, so it, it appeared in two different products and in general, I offer a bunch, I try to be constructive in that paper, um, and offer a bunch of solutions and I'm happy to share with anyone who asks, um, who needs it. Um, so the main thing I would suggest is something that I, I suggested it because I kind of knew it was coming out because I talked to Compton Tucker about it years ago. I didn't know it was coming out so soon. It came out in nature this week, uh, which is combining, um, not just relying on maps that are based on, um, spectral data, but actually incorporate radar data, which are more sensitive to biomass. And you can hit a tree when it's, um, and also to bring in high resolution data. So the combination of two of those, the person who published in Nature this week had a paper out, I guess, a year or two ago where they combined radar and uh, spectral data and were able to map biomass and tree cover all across North uh, the Sahel and um, and they just came out with a map of individual trees using high resolution imagery across that entire region. I think they processed uh, roughly 11,000 high resolution satellite images, but the map is soon to be going up. And I think the, I believe WRI may be hosting that map on its global forest watch site. I'm not sure about that. It's hot off the presses. Great, thank you. Um, there's another question that came in um, about regional data sets. So you were mentioning how these global data sets um, are so coarse filter and, and what's needed is regional, national. Can you talk a little bit about the Rome efforts or any efforts at the national level? 
Sure. I would say that the best approach is actually to, to mix global and regional data sets together because global data sets are often very high quality, but can have unexpected biases. And I've published a couple of papers recently just examining those at the scale of Costa Rica, where we have a lot of data, noticing, for example, in the talk I showed that tropical dry forests are being underestimated. Um, and one of the really, I think, interesting things is that countries um, can bring in their local expertise, local land cover maps, and integrate those with maps from across the world, which are often based on a much larger training data set with a lot more effort going in. Um, and as far as Rome goes, I think depending on which country you're talking about, um, the data was more or less optimistic. The estimates are more or less optimistic. I think that process is not one that I'm intimately familiar with. I've read a few Rome documents, but that's like saying, um, sorry, it's an American joke. I stayed at a Hojo Inn once. Uh, that doesn't make me an expert in Rome. And I think that um, those pro projects would be very encouraging. I think they're very ambitious, but if you look at the numbers, people are saying, oh, this is what we're gonna do. And the maps on the ground are generally good for the country. The question is simply, of course, uh, whether or not countries are willing to invest or able to invest. That's a real key point. The amount of money required, the amount of resources, and the amount of sudden changes in their agricultural systems to make the restoration they're hoping to make happen, happen. So I, I'd say Rome is a wonderful thing. It just happens to result in some very ambitious estimates. In some cases, those estimates have been met. For example, the U.S. met its 17 million hectare estimate, or 15 million hectares at 17 now, but it largely met it through burning forests, right? So it kind of did the lowest cost, easiest way to restore. Um, and that's just something that you, you have to be aware of. Maybe the US underestimated how much restoration it could do. Maybe other countries are overestimating though. And I think engaging with countries that these are opportunities where we can um, funnel uh, assistance from international scale and work with locals to sort of see what is, what is reasonable, what is feasible, what needs to be done. I'm going to switch topics and now move in some, to some of the social aspects of tree plant campaigns and ecological restoration and start with a question to Pedro, which is for us non-Brazilians, can you talk a little about how the current political climate in Brazil has influenced attitudes towards forest restoration and specifically natural forest restoration? Yeah, thank you for the, for the question. That is the very interesting question because for for the past few years I have worked with forest restoration and now I have spent most of my time uh, discussing how the political situation in Brazil can can worsen the environmental situation here so I have focused all of my research and attention to deforestation in trees in the Amazon and even in the Atlantic forest where I work so it changes completely our focus because the new political situation has now pushed deforestation. And then we cannot just pretend it's not happening and just continue to plant the trees. So I think now we, we are now more focused on how to prevent deforestation while we are still trying to restore some areas. The main focus has, has shifted from restoration to to deforestation control and all of the political issues related to it, as you may imagine. And I just wanted to give Pedro some kudos. I know he's been working really hard and has, in fact, been writing op-ed pieces to try to really try to do what he can to slow um, some of the efforts of the current government to try to undermine um, uh, forest protection. So. And continuing on in that theme, there are two related questions. One is about social conflict issues which may arise on account of tree planting, and then recommendations for engaging stakeholders in the adaptive management process and securing commitments for monitoring. Yeah, th that's also a critical issue because in my perspective, we sometimes, we are, as restoration practitioners, we are very good for getting soil samples and understanding the vegetation and many different biophysical issues, but we are very weak in understanding the social context in which we implement our efforts. And that is critical because as Matt mentioned, restoration is not uh, like reforestation projects are not an 
an island. They, it interacts with all of the sur surrounding social ecological conditions. So we do have to engage people. That's one first critical issue, how to bring people to discuss the project. And then how we can make use of all of the feedback and impressions and values and concerns that people have to improve the project planning and implementation and monitoring. So although we, 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 we may have many different uh, actions to be sure that the social conflicts will be avoided. I think the first and most important one is to, is to engage people. If they are not part of the process, it will be imp impossible to, to understand how these social conflicts will arise. So I would leave this, this most important recommendation, engage people and listen to them. Can you talk about maybe a few specifics about what has worked in the Atlantic Forest? Um, uh, I think that, um, I mean, I think the actual, um, there aren't unfortunately a lot of, I would say personally, really good success stories, but we all know, I should say all three of us are natural science by training and you know, one of Matt's recommendations and, but the people are, are the most important thing and getting people engaged. And most of the tree growing efforts that are being done are being done in lands where people are living. And that's been one of the concerns mm -hmm. about the forest cover maps that Matt's been talking about is that people estimate how much, how many, where we can grow trees without thinking about the people in there. And so most, I would say tree growing efforts have to focus on how we can get some income from people on the land. And that's where um, most of my own research, to be quite honest, has been more focused on growing forests back, but that's, that's not, that's a certain, Goal. There's these all these different goals, and that's why we're talking about the goals. But a key goal in a lot of cases is to engage people. They have to have some income coming from that. And that's something that I'll say that Pedro has done quite a bit on, of thinking about creative ways of whether somebody asked about red, and I would just sort of talk about payments more broadly, that that is one possibility is some transfer of payments. And there's been a lot of critique in literature of what has and has not worked on that front. It's also thinking about, you know, what species you plan about, where you can sell them. And Pedro can talk a little bit more about a couple of things that he's done. Um, some of the key characteristics over and over again that come up are like the example that I talked about. It's engaging people in the planting, giving them the capacitation, making sure they're getting some compensation and not just the compensation to put the trees in the ground, but the compensation to keep the trees in the ground. Um, I was involved recently in um, the World Economic Forum. They had a competition, their uplink challenge, and the people who had made it to the semifinals and the finals, I listened in, and they had these different ways of trying to increase tree cover. And my question over and over again was, so how long are you monitoring or how long are you paying people? And the most I ever heard was two years. Um, and so we have to be thinking about, and this isn't easy, um, but the places that have been successful are, are showing, I would, you know, are showing more success are where people have been involved and there maybe you're doing some selective logging, you're farming or you, so yeah, so there's, it isn't easy. And I think that there are starting to be more case studies. Um, uh, and I actually, Robin Chesson, who's showing up on our, uh, on our panelists list here has done some work in actually, um, uh, in actually trying to put together some examples of success stories that are starting to happen and trying to figure out, um, I mean, I don't think there's any perfect success story because it has to be tailored locally, but, you know, what type of characteristics and what things are working so those can be shared more. Yeah, I, I think one critical issue also is to bridge the gap in between international global scale targets with the work of local organizations. So for me, that's a critical gap we have today in tree planting programs. So here in, in the Atlantic Forest, we created this coalition, the Atlantic Forest Restoration Pact in which we brought together big companies and NGOs and researchers and farmer organizations in order to, to, to like to fill this gap. And that has been critical because this group, this coalition has gave the, 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 some of the solutions to integrate the global with the local context. For instance, they, the farmers have, have said quite often, we need to make money on restoration or tree planting. 
for environmental purpose. Otherwise, impossible. Then we created, we, we developed this alternative tree planting uh, project in which we intercrop eucalypt with native species. It may not be the ideal solution for inver- environmentalists, but can be the, you know, the, the real solution for upscaling restoration. Sometimes environmental NGOs, international NGOs, they don't like herbicides, but their farmers, they use it regularly for managing tree planting, and they may have to use it to reduce tree planting costs. So, you know, there may be many conflicts when we try to integrate those scales. And the best recommendation I could give is create coalitions, create groups of different stakeholders, diversify the discussion, because we do need to understand what different groups of stakeholders think about the process and to integrate the potential solutions that may arise from this very, you know, productive and interesting debate. Thanks um, to all of you. I want to point out that we're right at the hour, so many of our participants may need to jump off to continue their day. We have had several questions come in, more from the ecosystem side. What is a tree planting campaign um, and um, the underlying ecological basis for choosing species? So I'll ask a few of those questions. Those of you who need to leave, thank you so much for joining us. And as a reminder, our November series will focus on uh, resilience. And we have, again, a group of speakers who are all active in the resilience thematic group of IUCN's system management. So please come and join us next week. And then I'll um, ask Karen to maybe talk a little bit about what is a tree planting campaign? There was a question, is it different than reforestation? And several questions about how to choose species, whether you need to take into account the evolutionary trajectory of the ecosystem and um, how secondary forests, existing secondary forests fit into these campaigns? Um, That's a really good question. And one of our concerns is that it's really unclear. There are these targets and these targets are being put up at multiple scales. And some of them are different, like the bond challenge was a certain area of land. Um, The most recent tree planting campaigns, they set numbers on the numbers of trees planted. And there are differing qualities and depending on the specific campaign, when Pedro and I were writing our papers and we thought there was one and then we started researching and we started realizing that there are at least three at the global level that are promoting a trillion. uh, at what I would call the low end of it, you know, there was this YouTube campaign where they're just like, they're like trying to, they just want you to plant a tree. And that's the problem. We're told to plant a tree and we have no idea where that money is going. And there are some really good examples of trees being put in the wrong area. And it's so focused on planting trees. Um, I will say that some of the other ones, you know, the ones that, you know, some of the larger um, NGO conservation NGOs, they acknowledge, and so does actually the World Economic Forum, that trees, they don't just have to be planted trees. They can be trees that we're keeping standing. They can be trees that are regenerating. And that's what we want to say is that trees are all, you know, good. We don't necessarily always need to be planting them and that's not the most cost effective. But the concern about these is like you get these pop-ups when you're on the the web saying, oh, plant a tree. Well, you have no idea where they're planting, what they're planting, how they're planting, whether it respected the local people are involved. And so, these are, there's sort of targets, but then there's really no commitments. And I mean, and another one is, I mean, uh, I'll say, talk about my own government, um, that even President Trump and the Republicans in the United States are signing on to tree planting campaigns when at the same time they're, you know, reducing every other type of legislation like methane leaks and, you know, more efficient cars and environmental quality. They're underdoing every, every sort of environmental law in the United States. But they're saying they'll plant trees, but who knows what that tree planting means. And, you know, there's just nothing behind it. So that's really what our argument is trying to say. Let's take this, but let's say, how could we do this better and say it's growing trees. And so it is secondary forest and growth. As far as what criteria should be used in selecting trees, that really depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to sequester carbon, then you want something that 
grows quickly and has a high you know, carbon density in the tree. If you're doing it for biodiversity, then you maybe want to pick tree species that are either rare or that they provide resources for fauna. If you're concerned about human well-being, then you may want to think about species that are, you know, have economic value. And so there's all these different criteria, and there's been some good papers written on that. Um, we talk a little bit about it in Pedro's and my longer paper in Journal of Applied Ecology. But there's this whole process we have to think about, you know, which ones make the most sense, and then how do we balance those if we're trying to meet multiple goals? And there's also somebody talked about genetics and evolution. Absolutely, that's another thing. Um, Peter and I have this table in our Journal of Applied Ecology paper of the questions you should ask. And it's a very long table and it doesn't even include all the questions. And some of those are, you know, what genetics do you want to be using so that the trees are here now and that they grow in the future? And so there's a lot of debates in the restoration literature about, you know, to what degree are you balancing current conditions versus future conditions? And those, you know, we don't have a, you know, a simple answer to that question, but we need to consider that. And there's a lot of focus on trying to improve the genetics of species that are being planted so that they are, you know, more um, stronger trees, more likely to survive. And so these are all questions that need to be thought about it. And our concern is like what the public is being told is just pay your dollar and plant a tree. And while it may cost a dollar to plant a tree, it costs more than a dollar to maintain a tree, monitor a tree, and make sure that the person who owns the land is getting some compensation from that tree. And so that's really what I think our message is. I don't know, Pedro or Matt, if you guys want to add anything to that. I wanted to add one thing, which is oftentimes when we talk about where to plant trees, the tropics is an obvious answer, because we know that if we're talking about storing carbon, trees store carbon, but in the tropics, they also don't heat up the atmosphere in the same way. If we're planting trees in the boreal zone or in Wisconsin, we want to be careful it, it, to not plant trees that are evergreens because they, those trees at least will have a lower impact just from heating the earth from the color. So the darker green of trees uh, in mid latitudes, sort of subtropics, you know, Georgia on south, um, if you're, but subtropics and tropics, planting trees are more or less a net gain regardless of the change in tree co of color, the albedo of the planet. Um, so it's just something to consider that oftentimes restoration has a greater impact the further south you go. I also like to point out, and yeah, in my trade-offs of tree planting, that's one that we do talk about, but it's kind of a complicated factor, so I didn't go into it in my short time. I like to point out, too, if you think, and most of you, I think, are international, but in the United States, uh, most of our eastern forest, hardwood forest on the east coast of the United States, it all regenerated on its own. Those trees were not planted. It's a huge amount of carbon sequestration, biodiversity conservation, but it's also land that generally it's regenerated because people are not using it for economic reasons at this point. I mean, there are also tree plantations there, too. So. Great, thank you. I want to try to squeeze in two more topics. And Karen, you mentioned the cost of tree planting. There were a couple of questions that came in about whether there's resources for estimating costs as well as resources for finding funding. And I know this isn't exactly squarely in any of your areas, but if you could comment on any information you have. Um. I'm going to talk on sort of the global scale, and then I'll, Pedro's thought about a lot of this in Brazil, so I'll let him pass to him. One thing that was interesting in reviewing these proposals for the World Economic Forum Children Tree Challenge was that was a fair amount of what was going on. They're trying to do through their network is trying to link up people who are interested in funding with people who are doing um, tree growing elsewhere. And so I, I don't think there's somewhere one can go immediately, but they're trying their efforts to try to better coordinate those people and trying to link those up. Um, it is a it is a good question of sort of how do you know to trust the groups that you're working with if you're going to contribute to that. And um, I something that's something we should probably think about a little bit more about how we kind of do that. But there are some efforts to kind of um, link people up better, but I don't know, I see Matt nodding, so I don't know if he has an answer on that one, or you're just agreeing that we need to work on that. Sorry, I didn't mean, I, I am agreeing we need to work on that, because I think right okay. now, if you're a local, it's hard to know where to go, other than the few very obvious high-level things. There's some competition, some campaigns to link funders with the tree projects, but that's got to fund a small fraction of the effort out there in the world. Okay, Pedro, you got something you want to say about Brazil? What you've been doing? Yeah, we we did some surveys on restoration, implementation, and maintenance costs here in Brazil. So 
it's it can generate a very interesting database about it, but it's rare to find restoration cost data at the global scale. But it's doable. We are now uh, starting an initiative with FAO to collect this kind of data. But I'd like to highlight that when we talk about restoration costs, most people think about and collect data about tree planting costs and maintenance costs. But for me, the most scarce, uh, the most scarce input for tree growing programs is not tree seedlings, is land. So this is the first and most important resource, land. And we have, and we have to account for land opportunity costs and also to find ways to create space for restoration and for tree planting. Because, for instance, here in Brazil, 75% of all of the deforested area has been used for extensive cattle ranching and we are exporting beef is one of our most important agricultural products. So how can we make space? We can how can we create space for tree planting and for restor restoration? Of course, we have to, to, to find ways to, to raise cattle better. Otherwise, it would be impossible to compete for land with agriculture. Or, so in a nutshell, we have to consider that in order to achieve ambitious tree planting and restoration commitments, we have to integrate the agricultural sector because they will give they will give us the opportunities for restoration. Most of the countries where most of the areas being reforested are pri privately owned. So we have to integrate this group of people to create space for tree planting. Great, thank you. Um, the very last question was actually posed by Brock and it's about where people can find opportunities to learn about using remote sensing products in order to help do these kinds of prioritizations and assessments. Matt, maybe you want to answer if there's any available tools for people from different regions. Sure. Um, I'm not going to do the topic justice. And I think part of it depends on access to the internet. But assuming you have decent computing resources and access to the internet that's sufficient to view this seminar, um, the first and easiest is just to say Google Earth Engine has a whole set of tutorials. It is free and it is brings the world of satellite imagery to your fingertips. So pretty much every free satellite image that you can name is there and can be analyzed in the cloud and then products can be downloaded. So it's a very powerful resource. And I know that NASA Severe program uh, conducts a lot of trainings on this topic. Uh, there are Spanish language trainings, English language trainings, uh, they're, they have programs in West Africa, and their staff are wonderful. In fact, I believe Africa Flores just won a World Geospatial Award. Uh, one of their their staff, uh, one of their staff scientists, and uh, they are just amazing. And they are, if you are in a region covered by Severe, it is a wonderful resource for sort of bootstrapping projects. Um, and I see people are posting stuff in the, in the links, and I'd love for you to help me because there are literally uh, uh, hundreds of good resources to learn remote sensing. I would say to leapfrog a lot of things right to the front of the line, um, Google, Earth Engine, Google Earth Engine is a great place to start. Um, you also can do really great remote sensing in QGIS and R and Python and a number of other programs. NASA RSET, thank you. Uh, that's a really obvious one I didn't mention. Yeah, I don't do this for a living. In fact, I'm, I'm right now consulting with a, with the government and they're asking me for training resources. And I've been Googling my colleagues trying to find more. Um, but there are so many good resources out there to learn. I think the main thing that I wanted to do with the link I posted is there are also resources for spatial planning. And a lot of that software is free. Most of it is free. Um, and the spatial planning software that people use for say, how, where do we put protected areas can also be used to ask questions like, where should we restore to maximize different things? There's also um, ecosystem service, service tools where you could estimate for a landscape, um, what ecosystem services you might see by planting in different areas and zones. And the name of the tool is escaping right now. It comes out of the University of Stanford. Karen, do you know what, which one I'm talking about? I wanna say, there you go, invest. I was about yes. to say it, yep, invest. So there are a lot of tools out there. Um, 
And I would say that there's going to be new data at the Global Forest Watch website, WRI, on the trees outside forests. That's one of their central focuses. And I think the data that just came out in Nature this week, basically mapping trees outside forests all across the Sahel, that's going to be available there. Um, so, yes, it's a it's an exciting time with more resources than you can shake a stick at. Aaron, Pedro, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that'd be a good resource to kind of put together a list. And I was the other thing I was going to say to Brock was maybe we could save the chat too because yeah, the chat is blowing up with wonderful resources. Yeah, there's a lot of everyone. suggestions that we have crowdsourcing this question. So yeah, yeah. There's, one, there's one thing yeah. I wanted to return to an earlier question really fast and just point out that oftentimes we need to think about the power dynamics, and that's one reason I talked about social scientists is when you're talking about corporations and governments interacting with smallholders. You, you really need to think there's you're speaking from a great height to people who may not have a lot of power. Um, and that's where bringing in someone like a social scientist can help you understand the social landscape and what contracts is this in that social landscape. Um, and I we, think also just to talk about that, I think it's about social scientists. I think it's where when Pedro and I were writing about sort of think about how to coordinate across the scales, the example I gave from Atlantic Forest, that you need some sort of intermediary organizations if you're going from international to the local scale. One of the problems has been, and if you look in literature, is that in a lot of countries, there's a lot of corruption. So trying to figure out who that, who that organization is at that scale can be challenging. But in the places that I've seen that are more successful, there is usually some group in the middle, and Pedro and I talk about that in our Journal of Applied Ecology paper, that provides some technical capacitation, expertise, but also negotiation at the international scale. And I really think that going between those scales we're going to need those types of intermediate organizations, whether they be through the government or I think more often it's been sort of regional, you know, groups, um, sort of boundary organizations that are joining those two levels. Thanks, Karen. So all three of you, Karen, Pedro, Matt, thank you so much for the rich conversation. And to all our participants, thanks for joining us. We will share the chat and the Q&A with our presenters so they can follow up individually. Um, this is a networking opportunity, which is why we encourage folks to put your contact information, what you're working on, et cetera. We have people from all over the world participating in these events. If you are interested in um, getting the full chat text, contact Brock Blevins. And if you scroll all the way up to the top of the chat, his email contact as well as mine is listed there. And again, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. You'll get a ping when the video is posted. You can also see all the previous webinars starting from the start of the series in 2019. You can contact us to learn more about the Commission on Ecosystem Management, uh, which is a commission within IUCN. And we hope we'll see you next month um, for a discussion of resilience and ecosystem restoration. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great month. Stay safe.